welcome back to session five of our Dayton Women in the Word Second Timothy study. Congratulations, you've made it halfway. It is time to celebrate, eat a piece of chocolate or something. I know I certainly did. You've come a long way and we are proud of you. Hopefully you are getting into the rhythm of regular Bible study and getting a glimpse of what a deeper dive into scripture can do for your relationship with the Lord. Last week, Daisy talked us through the four patterns or pictures of what laboring for the gospel can look like. We talked about the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. And lastly, we talked about our ultimate example of endurance, Jesus, who we continually remember to give us strength for the work and suffering for the gospel that lays before us. We ended with a little poetry, a praise break that Paul interjects into the middle of this letter to Timothy. Today we are going to talk all about words, but before we do that, I want to pray over my words. So would you bow in a word of prayer with me? Dear Jesus, thank you again for the privilege it is to open the word of God with the ladies watching today. Help my words to be helpful, not hurtful. We know that your word is not empty. It does not return void. So God, help us to focus on your word today and may this lecture honor your heartbeat for the words you've given us through Paul's letter to Timothy. Amen. Okay, as we look at 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 26 today, we're going to cover three different sections. The first one, 2 Timothy 2, 14 through 19, I'm calling words, words, words. The second section, 2 Timothy 2, 20 through 21, are all about honorable and dishonorable vessels. And the last section we're covering today, 2 Timothy 2, 22 through 26, I'm calling Movement with the Spirit. Let's get started with that first section. So please pause the video if you need to and turn with me in your copy of the scripture to 2 Timothy 2, verses 14 through 19. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some, but God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. It's appropriate we talk about words today because you all just conducted your word study in uh, your tools this week. I'm going to try to highlight several of the words you may have looked up in our lecture today. Words are so important. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Words bring life and death. They can be unhealthy and they can be healthy. We need to understand the power of words, and especially we need to understand the weight of our words when it comes to the word of God. We're going to revisit the theme of teaching, the theme of teaching that we find all throughout in 2 Timothy in this session. We know from the book of James that teachers will be judged to a higher standard. Teachers have influence over their hearers, and their influence should be focused one way, towards Jesus. Paul is a teacher. Timothy is a teacher. Paul is going to be talking to Timothy about false teachers. And we, you and I, are teachers. Your life is always teaching someone else about what you value and what you believe. 
Whether you have a formal position of teaching or whether you've been given the spiritual gift of teaching, followers of Jesus ought to choose words that line up with the gospel they proclaim. So let's listen, keeping that in mind. Paul starts off this section saying, remind them of these things. Let's slow down. Remind. There's that theme of remembering again. Them. Who is them? Well, it could be Christians in general, but it's more likely from the context, especially what comes further on in this section, that it's referring to the teachers that Timothy is going to entrust the gospel message with, just as Paul has entrusted it to Timothy. So what things is he to remind them about? Well, the previous section was all about the gospel and Paul's willingness to suffer for it so that even more will be saved. Then Paul says to charge them and he gives four sets of instructions. There is a don't do this, do this structure. The first instruction is don't quarrel about words. We don't know exactly if there was a specific quarrel or, Paul, or words that Paul is referring to. The ESV study Bible says Paul is talking specifically about meaningless arguments here, as Paul is absolutely willing to challenge something that really matters when the gospel is at stake, for instance. Paul is saying, don't get in to meaningless quarrels. We also know from the book of James where quarrels stem from. He writes in James 4.1, What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Quarrels start within. They begin with our motivations, our desires, our passions that are already at war within us. And inevitably, those wars will spill outside of us. So Paul says, don't quarrel about words. Why? It doesn't do any good. It only ruins the hearers. It ruins the hearers in two ways, because it's exhausting and it's distracting. The NASB uses the word wrangle here instead of quarrels. Have you ever wrangled anything? I've certainly wrangled many a toddler, and it has left me very exhausted at the end of the day. Or have you heard the phrase wrangling a cat? It's pretty pointless, and you feel exhausted trying. Instead of spending your energy on a really worthwhile goal, and Paul is saying, don't exhaust yourself on these meaningless arguments. Focus on the goal that God has set for you. It's not only exhausting to wrangle about words, it's distracting. Remember all the patterns that Daisy talked to us about last week, the soldier, athlete, farmer? They have to be very focused, and Timothy needs that focus. To spend time and energy on these arguments is, take, is to take away from the ultimate purpose he has. So there's the first instruction, don't quarrel about words. The second instruction is a do instruction, and we need to pay attention to it because it is the only positive command in the midst of these three other negative commands. Do present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed by rightly handling the word of truth. So how does one go about rightly handling the word of truth? Well, first of all, a good student or a good teacher is first of all a good student. They're learning from the Holy Spirit in his words, in his word. They have a regular pattern of Bible study so they can increasingly improve in their ability to interpret the scripture with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the best teacher. So they're a good student and they also practice communicating the Bible with excellence. They stick to what God says and how he says it. They don't take or add, or add to what God says. And they are humble and admit when they aren't sure about something. They always point back to the gospel, to Jesus and his death and resurrection and all that means for our lives and for our world. 
and they work at it with focus and excellence. By the way, if you feel a stirring to teach the Bible, we have a place for you. Please come to our teaching collective. We'd love to have you there. And we have another session starting in August. But it's a great way to do just what Paul is calling Timothy to do here. Rightly handle the word of truth. The third set of instruction is don't participate in irreverent babble. Avoid irreverent babble. Now you might be wondering how this is different. How is this different from quarreling about words? Well, there are ways we can participate in a quarrel without necessarily being the instigator or the primary party. Just by giving attention to something, you are participating. You might have looked up the word babble in your word study this week. It is the Greek word kenophonia, which means empty, vain, useless, or fruitless discussion. Why should we avoid it? It's contagious. It leads people into more and more ungodliness. And Paul's example here is pretty gruesome. He brings up gangrene. And that is a disease when the tissues die after a loss of blood used to illness, injury, or infection. Even today, with our modern medicine, amputation is a treatment that is used if gangrene is not caught soon enough. We might not see a lot of cases of gangrene in our lifetime, but we are certainly familiar with an infectious disease, COVID-19. And we understand we have to distance ourselves from the infection because it is contagious. Paul uses this medical phraseology to give us a good picture of how repulsive false teaching is and contrasts it with the sound, healthy teaching he is calling Timothy to. It might sound rather drastic that we must amputate this babel, but Jesus uses these kinds of terms as well when it comes to sin. If we look at Matthew 5.30, Jesus says, If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. And in John 15.2, Jesus says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. The process of spiritual growth involves identifying unhealthy patterns, sin, and false teaching, and cutting it off. Not only to prevent the spread of more ungodliness, but also so that there can be health, righteousness, and truth. There's one more instruction here. Paul says, don't be like Hymenaeus and Philetus. Paul gives an example of unhealthy teaching as he calls out two false teachers in the church in their time. Why does he do this? They have swerved from the truth. They've said the resurrection, the second one, has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. And this is a dismantling that comes when one does not have the founda their foundation of faith set on the truth to begin with and then accepts a manipulation of the truth, which is no truth at all. A quick example I see in our modern day of swerving from the truth is a message like, just believe in yourself. Usually a speaker or a Hallmark card <laughs> would use this to try to encourage someone to overcome, to change, and to heal. That sounds lovely, and it's usually packaged even lovelier, except it's just not true. We cannot find it within ourselves to mend what is way too broken for us to fix. We need something outside of us to come inside of us and clean up that mess. Believing in ourselves simply will not work. Believe in Jesus. This is the only way we can truly be fixed and healed and overcome from the inside out. This is a simple, seemingly harmless statement that swerves from the truth in a devastating way with devastating results. 
After the instructions and examples of do's and don'ts, Paul ends this section with reassurance for Timothy. But their plans can't su succeed because God's foundation is secure. And that foundation is most likely referring to the elect here, God's chosen people. The Lord knows who are his. Full stop. God knows us. That's mind-blowing. 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. And John 10, 14, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Then Paul says something else. Let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. And that reminded me of what Jesus said again in John 10, this time verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So knowing God requires following God away from sin and towards righteousness. There is movement with the Spirit, and we will talk about that again in our last section. Paul is really hitting something home here for Timothy. He repeats this message again and again in the pastoral letters, first and second Timothy and in Titus. And it's worth repeating here again to Timothy. My summary of it is listen, don't get caught up in these controversies. It's a trap. It's a waste of your precious energy and training that I gave you to go back and forth with this foolishness. Stick to the capital T truth. You are secure in Christ's foundation. So our main truth for this section is Christian teachers don't waste energy on unhealthy controversy but rather commit their energy to teaching the truth of the gospel. Let me repeat that. Christian teachers don't waste energy on unhealthy controversy, but rather commit their energy to teaching the truth of the gospel. Paul has yet another metaphor for us to contrast those who serve the Lord by speaking the truth versus those who do not. Let's move on to our next section, chapter 2, verse 20 and 21, all about honorable and dishonorable vessels. Let's read it together. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You might be familiar with something like this in our culture today. I have brought here to show you my grandmother's China gravy boat. Every holiday, my mom and my grandma would get out the china. They would pull out uh, from the china cabinet where they had it set apart, and they would put it on the table, making it ready, but not for us, the kids, who will, were at the kids' table where there will forever be solo cups and plastic ware. It was set apart for honorable use, and when the time came, it was ready. You might not feel like a piece of fine china. I certainly don't. But when God saves you, he redeems you. When he sees you, he sees Jesus, who had no chips or stains on him. And you are being transformed into his likeness every day. What's amazing is that when you are saved, every day is a fine China day. He doesn't intend to lock you in a cupboard but intends to invite others to the better and more beautiful way every single day. In God's kingdom, every day is a celebration of what God has done and what God will do. You might be wondering, as I did, how this metaphor lines up with the metaphor of the laboring farmer, athlete, soldier. Following God can be really grueling, hard, dirty, gritty work. So how do these metaphors fit together? 
Well, although we are called to hard work, we're also called to purity that starts from the inside out. We are valuable. We are a workmanship, and God intends to use his workmanship for his glory. So let's look back at the section together and slow down. Whose house are we talking about? We're talking about God's house, and God is the master of the house. In 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul identifies the household of God as the church of the living God. We, the church, are God's house. God has made a home within us. He dwells within us. Before we were God's house, God's house was the tabernacle and then the temple, which had honorable vessels within them. Pause the video so you can turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 7, verse 48 through 50. It says, So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, the golden table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the south side and five on the north, before the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lamps, the tongs of gold, the cups, snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and fire pans of pure gold, and the sockets of gold for the doors of the innermost part of the house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the nave of the temple. Timothy would have known about these honorable vessels in the temple. And this comparison Paul is making would have been a familiar yet illuminating picture for him. Now, he is one of those honorable vessels in the house of God. But what does it mean to be an honorable vessel? Well, if you looked into this word in your word study, you would have found that it means valuable or set at a high price. The NIV, the NLT, and the CSB translate this word as special. This reminds me that God considers his people have high value, that his people have high value. We were bought at the highest price, the price of Jesus' death. We are precious, and it is with these precious vessels that our master intends to share his truth through to reach others. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I just want to pause here because many women struggle with their self-worth. Ladies, while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. Before you did anything, he paid the ultimate price for you. You are valuable. So we have the opportunity to view ourselves the way God views us. You are precious. You are special. And that is true not because I said so, but because God says so. And not because of anything you did or will do but because of what he has done. You are a valuable vessel. Then in the text, we get to this word, therefore, and that is a connecting word telling us to look back, pause a second, see how that section connects to the next one. Why is Paul using this example? He talked about God's house, honorable and dishonorable vessels. If we look back further, we see the examples of those teachers set apart for good work, like Timothy, in contrast to the dishonorable vessels, Philetus and Hymenaeus. Honorable vessels are pure, committed to the absolute truth of the gospel, and are motivated by glorifying God in their work. They are filled up to be poured out. Daisy will talk more about that in session eight. Dishonorable vessels, by contrast, are impure, veer from the truth, and are motivated by their own personal glory and gain. We must distance ourselves from dishonorable vessels, and especially their teaching. If you think about um, vessels in that time used for dishonorable use, think about the fact that 
these folks did not have any indoor plumbing. So vessels of this nature would be filled with all kinds of filth. When Paul is calling something a dishonorable vessel, he could actually be saying, listen, they are full of crap. Sorry, not sorry, Philetus and Hymenaeus. If anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use and set apart, useful and ready. Let's start with being set apart as holy. First Peter 1.15 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. Phew, that is a lot of holies. But what does that word mean? It means to be separate from sin, to be pure and dedicated to God. God is saying, you are mine now, and I'm without sin. Now you must be without sin, separated and dedicated to me. This process is all led by the Holy Spirit. We cannot cleanse ourselves. We need Jesus to do that. Well, you might be wondering, why is Paul saying, if anyone cleanses himself then, in verse 21? Well, you still have to agree with the process he is taking you through. Our flesh often still wars against us. We still live in this broken world and are prone to sin, even though our identity is one of cleansed vessel. We have a part to play in submitting to the Holy Spirit, setting us apart and walking in that new identity. A, a valuable vessel is also useful to the master of the house and ready for every good work. We need to always be ready for what God has for us. Be willing to bend to the Holy Spirit's call when he tells you it's time to move or to speak. In 2 Timothy 3, 17, we'll see that scripture actually equips us for every good work. The Bible helps us to be ready. Every day, we also need to be prepared that Jesus is coming back soon, and we want to be busy preparing for his return with good works. We want to share with others so they can be called also to the marriage feast. I think it's worth mentioning here that though God's servants are set apart, they are also sent. They have work to do. God was setting Timothy apart at the same time he was sending Timothy. Timothy was God's set-apart servant. Similarly, God is sending us. We are God's servants. He wants his honorable vessels to be set apart, useful, and ready. So our main truth for that section is God's vessels are valuable, and he has valuable work for them to do. God's vessels are valuable, and he has valuable work for them to do. So how does one become these honorable vessels? By moving with the Holy Spirit. Let's turn now to 2 Timothy 2 and read through this last section, verse 22 through 26. Oh, I lost my post-it. Here it is. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. In the Christian life, we are ever pursuing and ever fleeing. The Christian life is one of movement with the Spirit. Let's start with the flee part. 
flee youthful passions. This term, youthful passions, is a summary, but Paul will come back around to it with specific things to avoid in chapter 3, 1 through 9, that Laura will cover next week. But in the context of this section, it's especially targeting the youthful tendency to argue. When we're young, we think we know everything, right? There is hopefully some humbling that comes as we grow up. Same with the maturity process for Christ followers. We must submit to the humbling process of admitting we don't know it all and be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. A marker of Christian maturity is both the ability to foresee and avoid controversy and also the ability to engage in productive, meaningful conflict with wisdom and grace. And some of you who hate conflict just squirmed a little bit. I'm squirming with you. I know the feeling, but hear me out. Paul is coming back again to address controversy. It's important for him. He says, have nothing to do with this controversy and quarreling. These foolish, ignorant controversies, if we look closer at this word, zaitesis in Greek, it can be translated as debate or dispute or argument or speculations. These are ignorant, senseless, fruitless, and lead to more and more sin. And these controversies can actually happen amongst believers too. I am sure you've witnessed it. Perhaps you've even played a part in it. Some examples I've witnessed both in real life and online are those who create conflict out of thin air, who make mountains out of molehills, who pick the wrong battles or too many of them, who needlessly come out swinging, those who jump at the chance for an argument, those who like to argue for the sake of arguing, those who want to come out on top and will commit any number of sins to be seen as right. And oh my goodness, the internet trolls, am I right? Those who set the bait for these foolish, ignorant, needless arguments, or those who always have to have the last word. Then there are the pot stirrers, those who keep the argument going, gossip, quarreling, even if they weren't the ones to start it in the first place. There are those that always have beef or drama going on with someone somewhere. And there are the nitpickers, those who take a tiny piece of the overall discussion to argue with instead of looking at the heartbeat of the message that the person is trying to convey. This is absolutely exhausting. It tuckers me out just reading that list. And what we usually have to show at the end of these controversies is not fruit, but shattered relationships. We are to flee from these situations and from these people. So what are we to pursue instead? Christ-likeness. And how are we to pursue it together? Let's talk about that how one first. We're to pursue along with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. We don't pursue Christ in isolation. God gives us each other and tells us to run this race together. He gives us the church. And what are we to pursue together? Well, first of all, righteousness. I will ever, forever hear the turtle from Finding Nemo crush exclaim, righteous, righteous, as he caught the current and was swept away. And I thought, well, isn't that just a wonderful picture of catching God's current and being swept away into his way? Following the path of righteousness is certainly not always fun, but it is the most freeing and the most truly joyful way of life. We're also to pursue faith, which is a belief and trust and loyalty to God. 
Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So it's trusting in God even when you don't see him or know what the outcome of any given situation is going to be. We're also to pursue love, a deep devotion to God, and affection for him and what he loves. In 1 John, it tells us we show God love by loving others and obeying him. And peace. We are to pursue peace. And peace is that heart that can be at rest because it's following the Prince of Peace. Do you remember when we talked about how quarrels began? When there's a war going on inside of us? Fruitless quarrels will decrease immensely when the heart accepts the peace that is freely offered in Jesus. Now these are four things that we're supposed to be pursuing always, but Paul lists a couple more things we are supposed to be pursuing when it comes specifically to um, the opponents that we encounter. How are we to pursue Christ-likeness with opponents? This is challenging for us, but how we treat our opponents is perhaps one of the best witnesses we have for the gospel. Jesus told us to love our enemies in Luke 6. Why? Because while we were still enemies of God, he loved us. Because this is the bold Jesus kind of stuff that leads people to repent. Who are the opponents? Are they false teachers or are they unbelievers? In the case of Paul and Timothy, those he is talking about may be both. Why? Because if someone is not teaching the truth, they may not really know it. Because the truth must lead to Christ. In this section, Paul lists out four things we are to pursue with opponents. Gentle correction, kindness, a teachable moment, and patience. Gentle correction. Correction is never received well when it's done from a haughty spirit or from a hypocrite's lips. So we must ask ourselves if our lives correct others as much as our mouth does. I think a gentle correction is one that express, expresses that the other person is loved and that the correction is meant for the benefit of the one being corrected, not in order for the one correcting to be seen as superior. I think correction is best done on a one-on-one -on -one basis to start, so as not to embarrass the one being corrected. It's best done in the confines of a trusting relationship. And with a soft or at least level tone, ironically, I've seen that raising one's voice is a sure sign that you will not be heard. After gentle correction, Paul mentions being kind to everyone. In Romans 2.4, it says that God's kindness is meant to lead to our repentance. God's kindness is what leads us to repent. So God wants us to use our kindness here to lead, lead others also to repentance, whether they are teaching lies or believing false teaching. He also wants us to seize these teachable moments. He says that Timothy should be able to teach. God can give you a teachable moment in here with all these traits of his. A controversy can move to a loving conversation. When the motives move from individual glory to God's glory, and when pride is set aside, true learning can happen in the midst of that humility. And lastly, Paul tells Timothy to patiently endure evil. And when I looked up this word in the Greek, anexikakos, it's actually a whole phrase, patiently enduring evil. And it occurs one time in the Bible, right here. So I did some translation comparison uh, to be able to get to the meaning of this. The NASB says patient when wronged. The CSB says just patient. NIV says not resentful. The Amplified says patient and tolerant when wronged. The NLT says be patient with difficult people. And the message says working firmly but patiently with those who refuse to obey. 
I think it's worth mentioning here that endurance of evil can be held in the same space as hating evil. Endurance of evil can be accomplished while still hating evil. Scripture actually tells us to abhor evil in Romans 12, 9. God does this all the time as he patiently endures the evil that humankind commits so that more and more people can come to know him before the final judgment. The evil in particular Paul is talking about right here is haughty, quarreling, and swerving from the truth. And he's basically saying, hang in here. This is evil. But I can make beauty come from these ashes. How? God may grant repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. Knowledge here is apignosis. Precise and correct knowledge. The knowledge of things ethical and divine. So what I think this means is that these false teachers did not have a correct, true view of Jesus. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. True knowledge points someone to knowing Jesus, who is the truth. We must repent to have this relationship with Jesus, this knowledge of the truth, which means we have to turn from our sinful ways and towards Christ. You can tell if someone has true knowledge of the truth by what direction they're walking. You can see if someone is living a life repentant or not. Remember, what is inside of you spills out of you. If you believe the truth, you will speak the truth, and you will act from the truth. In verse 26 here, we see that these folks are in the devil's clutches, so they are likely not following Christ to begin with. I just want to say we're all serving someone. You're either serving Jesus or you're serving the devil's will. And your pursuits will re re reveal which master you serve. To sum up, what Paul is saying to S Timothy, don't pursue these pointless arguments, but make your responses so loving that it will be obvious that Jesus is your number one pursuit. As soon as a discussion becomes unloving, unkind, ungentle, impatient, it becomes unfruitful. However, with love, kindness, gentleness, and patience, essentially with Christ-like character, controversy can turn to conversation, which can turn to conversion. I just need to pause here and ask, who does this sound like? Jesus. When you follow the way of Jesus, you increase in these traits as you seek to look and sound and act more and more like him in every situation. Now is a good time to pause and take your Attributes of God handout on page 17 of your companion guide. What does this passage say about God? He is all the characteristics he calls us to be, and so he makes us like him. He is righteous, he is faithful, he is gentle, he is a teacher, he is patient, he is loving, and he is peacemaking. Let's remember that the reason we can pursue these traits is because Jesus pursued us first. The biggest example I see of gentle correction and teaching here in the Bible is Jesus with Nicodemus. And this account is in John chapter 3. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. And these Pharisees, remember, did not like Jesus or his teachings. Yet Jesus was gentle with him when Nicodemus came and answered his many questions. And this is where we get the landmark John 3.16 passage. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Because Jesus was lovingly sitting down with someone to talk, to talk, who very well may have opposed him 
at some point. Many have come to know him. We have this foundational passage that have led many to repent. What I think we can take away is very similar. We take the opportunity to share the gospel even in how we respond to those who are opposing the truth with love, gentleness, teaching, and patience. In my life, God is leading me to pay attention, especially to how I correct my kiddos. Harsh, harsh correction will not lead them to the truth, but God can use my gentle correction to lead them to Jesus. In my world, I've been more mindful of how I engage in discussions, particularly in the many we find lately online. The internet is not the kindest of places, is it, ladies? I'm asking God to help me avoid the fruitless arguments, but help me also to engage lovingly in real relationships, especially with those who need the kindness of our Lord. By the way, this isn't really just a message for how we treat unbelievers in a conflict, but how we should treat believers as well. When we have to confront each other, for whatever reason, it should also be with Christ-like character, with the heart of Jesus. The outcome will be more unity and strength among the body of Christ. So our main truth from this last section is this. When controversy is met with Christ-like character, it can turn to a conversation that leads to conversion. When controversy is met with Christ-like character, it can turn to a conversation that leads to conversion. So what does this practically look like? I just have a few points of application here. The first question I have for you is, do you know the truth? Jesus himself. If not, come to Jesus like Nicodemus did with all of your questions. Receive the good news that Jesus died for your sins and rose again so you can live with him in the better and more beautiful way. Know that you are valuable in God's sight. Secondly, if you know the gospel already, how do you plan to continue to be a good student of scripture? I ask you this because the application here is twofold. We really need better discernment about the messages we consume. And we also need to grow in our ability to communicate the truth. And we can't do either unless we know the truth. We must learn from the best teacher first, the ultimate rabbi, Jesus. And the fact that you're in this Bible study tells me that you are moving in the right direction. Well done. Keep going. And lastly, how do you participate in the disputes around you? Are you meeting controversy with Christ-like character? We must follow Jesus in the way of his gentleness, kindness, teaching, and patience. Let me tell you our homework for next week, and then I will pray us out. We must continue to be prayerful before, during, and after our study. Our reading will be 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 9. And our homework tool for this week is outlining. Remember to watch the out At Home in the Word video on our YouTube channel, on outlining to understand how you can be implementing this tool in your study. Let's pray. Rabbi, teacher, help us to know your truth and help us to follow you in your better and more beautiful way. I pray that you would help these honorable vessels be useful and ready for you and all you have for them. Set them apart, Lord, and help us to exemplify you in every interaction we encounter, whether it is a controversy or conversation or the way in which we act um, towards one another. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. <laughs>